On the 22nd of August, 1485, two armies took to the field here at Bosworth and shook the peace of this Leicestershire countryside. Cannon thundered as balls of stone and metal bounced across a field, crushing bone and tearing flesh. Archers unleashed clouds of arrows from deadly longbows that fell like hail. By the middle of the day, one king of England was dead, another was crowned. I'm here today to look at new evidence as part of a 20 year long archeological project that has redefined and reshaped our understanding of how the battle took place. I'm gonna meet the experts. We're gonna look at those finds that have come out of the ground. And we'll look at how it's changed our whole understanding of a battle that took place in these fields more than 500 years ago. So what do we know about the Battle of Bosworth? Well, we know who was here. We've got one army led by King Richard III. He's been King of England for just over two years. He's 32 years of age. Born in 1452, his life has been tossed up and down by fortune's wheel throughout the Wars of the Roses. He's risen, fallen, and risen again. He's been King for just over two years, but in the last year or so, he's faced personal tragedy. He's lost his only son, an heir, and then his wife, Queen Anne Neville. He's wearing his crown on his helmet for the battle, surely asking God to judge him as he takes to the field and to judge his right to the crown of England. Facing him, we have the 28-year-old Henry Tudor, a man who's been in exile for 14 years, for half his life in Brittany and then France. He's here with a French-sponsored army to try and take Richard's crown. He's very much the unknown quantity. And the third army in the field that day is that of the Stanley family, nominally led by Thomas Lord Stanley and supported by his little brother, Sir William. We don't actually know whether Lord Thomas Stanley was here or not. He's made a career during the Wars of the Roses of arriving late to battles, if he arrives at all, and always appearing on the side of whoever had just won. But he's improved his family's position throughout years of civil strife and conflict. And today, he's faced with a real choice. There's King Richard III, to whom he's given his fealty and sworn his faith. But there's also Henry Tudor, who is Stanley's wife's son. Stanley could be stepfather to the new King of England. As he looks down on the battle, this is the decision that faces the Stanley family. The Stanley family have accrued great power and wealth. Based around Lancashire and North Wales, they're capable of putting large armies into the field, which means both sides want the potentially decisive Stanley muscle behind them. Perhaps the outcome of Bosworth Field was always going to be decided by Thomas Stanley and what was best for Thomas Stanley. And this is how the battle was set up in close quarters. Richard on top of Ambien Hill, Henry at the foot. Richard launches a cavalry charge down the hill, clashing with Henry's army. And as the melee grows intense, the Stanley army intervenes and Richard is cut down, the last King of England to die on the battlefield. In that moment, 332 years of Plantagenet rule of England is ended and the Tudor dawn, an age that would redefine England, began. Or at least that's what we thought we knew. I'm here today to talk to Richard Mackinder to discover how new archeological evidence is radically altering our understanding of the Battle of Bosworth and how it was played out in these fields more than 500 years ago. Richard and his colleagues have spent the last 20 years scouring the site for archaeology that would shed light on how this critical day in history played out. And today, he's going to share the results with us. Richard, it's great to see you. Thanks Hi. for joining us here to tell us a bit more about what we thought we knew about the Battle of Bosworth Field. So what did we previously think was the situation with Battlefield of Bosworth? Well, in the 1970s, when the battle centre opened, we had a, an idea, a concept, that this battle was small, compact, and based around Ambien Hill, where this battle centre now is. 
We had Richard on the hill, we had Stanley to the north, and then we had Henry out on the western side. And that was how we thought it was. That was the interpretation we gave to hundreds of school children and to families, that it was all based around the hill. So the story was probably that Richard camped on the top of the hill, made his charge down the hill, met his end somewhere at the bottom of the hill, end of story in quite a small area. Exactly. But there was no hard evidence to back that up. So in 1999-2000, we started doing a small amount of work. That increased massively with the help of the lottery grant that we were given in 2005. And then by 2008, we were actually able to answer a relatively simple question of could we find a medieval battle site, with the answer being yes, but it wasn't on Ambien Hill. Oh, fascinating. So how did those 2008 finds start to change our understanding of this whole site? Well, first and foremost, it physically moved it away from the hill. Not a massive away, but it moved it, but it also made it far, far bigger than we had first given credit for. So where do we think Richard's camp should be moved to? Well, most logical would be crossing the line of the old Roman road between the villages of Sutton Cheney and Stapleton. And why would that make sense as a place for Richard to place his camp? Because that position is actually still the same height above sea level as we are here on the hill, but it's also got fresh water, which Ambien Hill doesn't have. You've got to water all of those horses, the men, the camp followers, all of those need that water. But you're still strategically at the same height, overlooking the lower lying ground to the west. And why move off the straight road if you don't need to? So where do we think Henry Tudor's army would have been positioned? Well, Henry is most likely drawing his men up ready for battle that far from Richard, which is why it expands that battlefield dramatically from what we had in the 70s, that small little compact area, to a far larger area on the landscape. And so the third main force that we need to think about as well is the Stanleys. Where do we think the Stanleys would have been positioned in this scenario? Well, this is always the, the crunch question because we have no first-hand accounts. The hint we're given is he stood betwixt the armies overlooking the field, which would put, by definition, on rising ground and between the two forces. So we move him down to around about that sort of position. So how did the archeological finds that you managed to pull out of the ground place all of this in the landscape and help make sense of this? We've done a certain amount of work. It's not complete, but what it's beginning to be indicative of is the fact we now have some finds coming up from around the Richard campsite. And excitingly, I think we can get our hands on some of those finds from the battle that have come out of the ground. Yes, we will be able to see some items uh, firsthand, but we need the protection. So not for yourself as much as for the finds. So I would ask you to put some gloves on. Richard and his fellow metal detectorists make up the Ambien Historical and Archaeological Research Group. Over the last 20 years or so, they've made some amazing finds, wonderful objects, each with a story to tell, but which as a whole have completely revolutionised our understanding of the location, the scale, and perhaps the tactics of the Battle of Bosworth. Now, as an author, you'll like this, because here we have what may be a late medieval inkwell. From where that was found, most likely one of Henry's people is giving an order. He doesn't trust the soldier to run and take it and remember it. So he writes it down for him and he sends it off to wherever. During the heat of battle, he loses it. When we then get a round shot, from the same area, you can then start to wonder, <laughs> why didn't he hold on to his inkwell? I'm not gonna be hanging around. Cannon had been used since the middle of the previous century and newfangled handguns were arriving in England from the continent during the Wars of the Roses. It was a developing and dangerous craft to fire balls of stone and metal at unfathomable speed with incredible destructive power accompanied by thunderous noise. 
gunpowder weapons could be as dangerous to those firing them as those they were aimed at. The sulphur left an eggy smell that was far from pleasant. And when the loudest noise you've ever heard before is a church bell or a clap of thunder, gunfire would be a new and terrifying experience for the senses. No wonder gunners were excommunicated by the church for meddling with such dark arts. And so these finds relate to an initial exchange of gunfire, placing armies and, and the confrontation around here. Do we have any finds that speak to the hand-to-hand the -hand combat that happened? So we know that the Duke of Norfolk leading Richard's army faces off against the Earl of Oxford leading Henry's army. Do we have an idea of where that kind of clash happened? We do. Uh, we've got some idea that these were actually further north. And from that, we can use our even smaller shot, which again is probably handgun because it's more mobile, it's smaller, but it's still equally as deadly. So this might have come from something that looks more like what we would consider to be a rifle. Yes, basically you're looking at a tube on a stick. It is that crude in, in, in that terminology because a rifle is an is a, uh, accurate weapon. These were very much like the blue touch paper and hope it goes in the right direction. Again, you're not really, I would expect, hitting a specific target. You're just aiming at that block of enemy. And the idea is to cause fear as much as it is to cause harm. Absolutely. And I think that's what it would have done. But also, you're then down to the hand-to-hand -hand weapons of the swords and, and the, uh, the close combat, face-to-face -face combat that you were going to get when you've got that Oxford-Norfolk clash off to the north. John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, was in command of Richard III's vanguard, the first part of an army to engage. Henry Tudor's army was led by the experienced John de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Richard believes the finds they've made offer an insight into the tactics deployed by Richard III on that morning. Small round shot and other evidence of close hand-to-hand -hand fighting to the north of both armies' locations suggests where this clash took place. Richard believes it reveals the King's plan to draw away part of Tudor's army by threatening to outflank them. When Oxford moves to engage Norfolk, it exposes the inexperienced Henry Tudor. If this was Richard III's battle plan, it was working so far. We also then have some other finds. A little French fleur-de-lis horse harness. So that was strapped to the leather of the horse, on his bridle or on his chest uh, or somewhere else on his horse. And obviously in that melee and clash, it comes off and again, it comes from that sort of area. And does that fleur-de-lis speak to the French element in Henry's army? Quite possibly. We know it's a French fleur-de-lis as opposed to an English because it's a slightly different design. Uh, fleur-de-lis is a heraldic symbol. So it's common across the continent and Britain as well. But this is a particularly French style in making. Another nice but very small find is a personal badge or button. That's silver and gilded. And we're pretty certain we've been able to identify that as Arthur Plantagenet. So we don't think he was fighting, we think he was observing. And we know that that's in an area next to the mill, which is where Norfolk retires to after the clash and eventually succumbs to his wounds and dies. And so we've got our kind of secondary battle happening up here, which is almost a diversion to clear the ground for Richard. And then we know that Richard does execute this cavalry charge across the battlefield. Does the archeology span tell us anything about how that finishes? I think it does. What we do have is one or two fine scatters of finds within that battle area, around the round shot. And we're pretty certain that Richard comes down and literally makes contact with Henry. So he famously kills Henry's standard bearer unseats a giant of a knight named Sir John Cheney. So do we think he's getting close to Henry at this point? I think the banner bearer would have been as close as I am to you. The question has got to be asked, did he mistakenly hit the banner bearer 
aiming for Henry and his lance wobbled at the last moment? Or did he deliberately take down the banner for the rest of the armies around in this large expanse of landscape to suddenly think, the banner's gone, what has happened to Henry? Is it over? So that could sow uncertainty and potentially stop the battle all the way over here at Oxford if he sees that banner fall quite possibly could stop fighting and that could end the day altogether however what I think happened was that process gave Stanley enough time to come around the landscape behind Henry and support Henry and push them all back towards the infamous marsh that Shakespeare tells us of William Stanley's mind was made up by what he saw unfolding. Richard believes it's now that Stanley rides to support Henry Tudor, betraying Richard III and driving the clash that would see the king killed. Do we think we know where Richard fell? <laughs> the million dollar question. Honest answer is no. We will never know for certain where exactly Richard fell. But we've got a good idea and that's in one very small find, right on the edge of the only piece of so far known medieval marsh. And that is a very small but very significant find of a solid silver and gilded ball. And, and I literally barely have words to tell you how excited I am to touch this, to have this in my hand. This is something made of solid silver. It would have been gilded, gold coloured when it went in the ground. And this we think is something that Richard gave to one of his senior followers. This would have been someone who was right near Richard on the battlefield, close to him in service, close to him physically, and they lost it, presumably when they lost their life. There is every potential that it was on a person stood next to Richard. We can't prove that, but it's certainly a good bet. And in that last few seconds of that melee, when people were being killed all around him, but we're told by all accounts that Richard fought bravely uh, and refused to leave the field, that that was in that close proximity to where Richard finally fell. And we do know exactly where that was found. And so possibly the most famous and significant find of the Battle of Bosworth. Having seen these incredible finds, I'm keen to get out into the battlefield site with Richard to see where these momentous scenes played out. And so this is where we think Richard may have camped on the night before the Battle of Bosworth. This is a good, likely place. You've got the line of the Roman road coming through here. You're on the same ridge that Ambien Hill finishes, and you've got this vista out towards where Henry was coming from. You've got a water supply. Everything is in its favour for being here. And on top of that, we do have some archaeological evidence to back that up. And so this would still have given Richard a pretty good view of the surrounding countryside. The appeal of Ambien Hill, where the battlefield centre is, has always been that it's on high ground with good views all around to spot Henry's army. But even in this modern landscape, you can see for quite a way if you wanted to keep an eye on where anybody else is. We are the same height as Ambien Hill, so we've still got that vantage. What you've also got to remember though is in 1485, these hedges and the trees weren't here. So the question that I've yet to answer is actually what could you see? Because that is the all important thing. You had to see your enemy or use the fact that they couldn't see you to your advantage. You could maneuver your men to a certain position and pop up. And this is what we need to now try and work out is actually what could have been seen and what couldn't have been seen. And where would Henry have been based from here? Where do we think Henry's camp was from Richard's position? Henry's campsite was Sheepy, uh, which is some miles away and to our right as we're looking at it. He then comes down the green lane and he ends up in the valley down towards where the farm is that you can see in the middle landscape there. So Richard would have had sight of Henry's army potentially from here. I mean, I assume he would have been using scouts to, to work out where Henry was, but there is the potential that he could see the movement of men from here. That's the million dollar question as to who moved first, who picked the ground. Um, it's always thought that Richard picked the ground first, but then Stanley also had local knowledge. 
he had support from a local lord and he would have known that ground intimately. So did he move first? Did Richard respond? Certainly sitting here, he knew on that Sunday night that he was going to need to use that road, which is another reason why he wouldn't have gone off the road some mile to Ambien Hill or to the battle center and camp there because he knows he's got to come back and then drag his cannon back down the road again. It's not a logical position. This is that logical position. The question that you've asked of who moved first, another million dollar question. So if Richard we think is here, Henry we think is somewhere over there, where is the third piece of the jigsaw? Where would Stanley have been based? Well, if you look on the skyline, you can see the church spire of Stoke Golding. Stanley, if my interpretation is accurate, is just to the right of the church as we're looking at it. So again, if you take the trees out on a clear day, you would have seen certainly potentially uh, shining silver, metal. Uh, the night before, you may have seen the glow of the campfires, but your scouts would certainly have been telling you where he was. The question on that Sunday night was who was he going to fight for? We're moving, as Richard thinks the armies did on the 22nd of August, 1485, to the spot where one of the battle's critical moments might well have taken place. Richard III and Henry Tudor are on a collision course that will decide the future of England, and we're going to stand where they clashed. Now, Richard, where are we? Orientate us a little bit. Where are Richard and Henry at this point? Right, Richard's campsite is way up onto our right-hand side. He's moved down into the main area, uh, slightly to our right now. The Oxford-Norfolk clash is taking place right in front of us, but some fields away. And Henry is off to our left. As the charge comes across the landscape, he hits Henry and then is driven back with the help of Stanley towards the marsh, which is here just in front of us. And this is the area in which Richard died. We can't pinpoint it. We can't put a, a stake in the ground and say it was here, but it was in that vicinity. We know that's the area of the marsh. We know some of the finds that are coming up, including that little boar badge, that all important badge. And that is the area in which it happened. So that is the most likely area in which Richard finally fell. So the fact of that high status boar badge being there gives us a good idea that that's where there was some really important action taking place. Richard has potentially gone past this spot, engaged with Henry, been pushed back, and then this is where that final exactly. stand is happening. Exactly. We've got some high status finds coming up from that end of the battle line, if, or the charge, and then we've got that drive back. And we know because we can join those dots, the direction Stanley must have been coming in to have driven him back. He can't have come in from this angle because he'd have driven him further away. To drive him back from whence he came must mean he was further to the west again and then driving him back. And this scatter of finds across that landscape is what helps us identify that. It's quite emotive to be in a landscape where people were fighting 500 odd years ago, but people were losing their lives here. People were fighting to the death. Not Very just Richard, so. but you know, dozens of people around him were we're dying in this landscape. Exactly. And today, you know, you've got the modern traffic, you've got the modern infrastructure. It's very easy to forget that. But a lot of people have that sixth sense. And that's something that shouldn't really be laughed at. And, and you stand them up on Ambien Hill and they don't feel that. You bring them down here and yet actually it works. It, the, the, the interpretation that we're putting on it today works with what they know and what they feel and what they can see and it goes back to that topography the topography is all important we're told that Richard charged down Henry in the 70s that was translated as Richard charged down the hill again because of Ambien but here we're looking at slight undulations of landscape and that's enough when you're on a horse to charge down somebody who's only on foot it must have been an amazing sight for the local villages that round here, what, what were they doing? The males of that village, were they hiding? Were they press ganged into fighting? Did they just watch it from the church spire, as we're told? Frightening experience. Terrifying, but incredible for you and I to stand here and look across this field in front of us and think that's where the Battle of Bosworth ended. That's where the last King of England to die in battle lost his life. That's where, for many people, the medieval period in England ended 
and the Tudor age began. The Tudor dawn happened right in front of us there. Yeah, yeah. Finally, Richard takes me to the spot where he thinks Sir William Stanley watched on, waiting for the moment to show his hand. Had he already promised to support Henry? Probably, but he was also sworn to Richard. From here, Stanley would decide the outcome of the Battle of Bosworth. So Richard, we think this is probably where Stanley was positioned, where he would have had his foot and his mounted men able to see both Richard and Henry's positions? Yes, we're on a, a, a brow or a rise. We're betwixt the two armies. We've got Richard slightly uh, to our, our front and our right, and we've got Henry down to our left. And this is where I suspect Stanley would have stood, betwixt the armies, overlooking the field, or at least that's where his foot would have been. Because I think his mounted troops, his light cavalry, were behind us on slightly falling ground, so they weren't visible by either Richard or Henry probably, but were therefore manoeuvrable. And that was a main tactic of cavalry, was to run around the battle site, wherever the field was, popping up, facing the enemy, getting the enemy to move, getting the enemy to try and double guess where their cavalry were going to be. So to do that tactic is not something that is um, not unheard of in, in, in this sort of uh, battle scenario. And that's where I think this all seems to fit. And behind us, we have a field that is still known to this day as the dining table, Stanley's campsite, where Richard loses his life in front. Henry then is crowned on rising ground, the first available ground out of that marsh in an area that we, we know that in the late 1300s was known as Garberfeld, and then after the battle in about 1520s, we know was called Crown Field. And this is probably where that took place. He was then taken back to the dining table, to Stanley's campsite for light refreshment, before making his way into Leicester, where he, we know he was there in time for Vespers. This is where British history was changed. This is that area. Because if it had been further away, he would have gone to the church in Stoke, where he would have been made king by divine right. He wasn't taken to the church. He was crowned on the field. It wouldn't have been in the marsh. It wouldn't have been where all those dead and dying were. He would have come out of that, slightly at least, and been crowned in front of his troops and anybody else on the field before being taken off and into Leicester. Well, I think for anyone interested in history, it's incredible to stand on, on this spot and think about the decisions that were made here and the way that the course of history was changed. I mean, as a Ricardian, I'm going to say Stanley made the wrong decision when he was standing here looking at everything. But nevertheless, we can stand in the places where he was watching this unfold and making decisions that impacted decades, centuries of British history from that point onwards. Very much so. And I think if he had have made that charge round as he did, but made it two minutes later or two minutes slower and Richard would have won, undoubtedly Stanley, being that shrewd politician that he was, would have turned around and said, my liege, I was, in, I was corralling Henry on for you, sir. I'm still on the winning side because he was a shrewd tactician. He was always going to make sure he came out on the winning side dare I say, smelling of roses. And perhaps we see there the ultimate victor of Bosworth. Henry VII gets a crown, Stanley family get the Earldom of Derby, all because he was able to position himself to see exactly what was happening, appear at just the right moment and appear to be doing whatever worked best for Stanley. Yeah. Seeing all of those finds and getting into the landscape of the Battle of Bosworth offers a whole new perspective on one of British history's most significant battles, and it's redefining our understanding of just how history was played out in the fields of Leicestershire. So over the last 20 years or so, Richard and his colleagues have utterly revolutionised our understanding of the layout of this battle. We've gone from this really close, tight sequence of events around Ambien Hill to something that spreads out through the landscape much more widely. Richard's army is further to the south and the east here. Henry is a long way to the west from where we thought he was. And the Stanley army weren't watching on from the north, they were watching on from the south side of the battlefield. 
All of this from the archaeological finds that have been coming out of the ground. This is why we need to protect our battlefields, to continue to study them and learn from them. In 20 years, we've revolutionised our understanding of a battle that took place 500 years ago. What might we learn in the next 20 years? We've got the Bosworth boar. What's the next find that's waiting to come out of the ground at Bosworth Field? Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. See you soon.